I want you to take your Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 18, and down through verse number 20. We're going to be continuing our series, um, kind of an, an impromptu series on the, um, the thought Bible fashioned. I thought we could do this all in one s- fail swoop. I almost said that backwards. Uh, but uh, that's not kind of, that's not how the Lord's led us. So Ephesians chapter number five, verse number 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another, In the fear of God. Dear Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word and the time that we've had to prepare. Father, we ask you now that you'd bless our people, your people. We pray that you would strengthen them, encourage them, and challenge them. God, we give you the grace. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're on this thought again, Bible fashioned. This is part three. Uh, we dealt with prayer. Why do we pray? We dealt with tithes and offerings. And uh, tonight we'll deal with singing. And um, in our text, verse number 18 down through verse 21, there's a lot of things in the co- confines of this text that I'd really love to be able to teach. But I, I want to be very mindful of the subject about singing tonight. And uh, we'll deal with a few things, uh, but we'll discuss why our services are the way they are. Why do we do the things that we do? Uh, but tonight, specifically, why do we sing? Why do we sing the songs that we sing? Why the style that we sing? And uh, so in that, uh, I'll go ahead and answer, we sing Bible-based songs and we sing hymns. Uh, every song that we sing, everyone that I've heard, has been based in the Bible. It's not just been a, a fluff song, and it's not just been, um, you know, just a, a, a song that that just kind of uplifts you with no basis in the Word of God. And so the hymns, Brother Reese Key and I were talking last night, and we were talking about those hymns. And if you look at them, especially even the one that we just read, or, or Saying tonight, sweet hour of prayer, it teaches you something about the benefit of prayer. If you look in Amazing Grace, uh, it tells us where we were and where we are now. You think uh, how firm a foundation, who who we are, and we're built upon the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. Uh, His blood is on my soul. Jesus paid it all. Jesus saves. All of these songs teach us something, and they can all be based in the Word of God. And so tonight, I really thought that I'd be able to breeze through this idea of singing and uh, maybe be able to go a little bit further, maybe spend five minutes on singing. But I'm going to tell you something. I spent at least two days uh, trying my best to figure out singing in the Bible and so far, this has been one of the most elusive subjects that I've ever dealt with. I mean, I went from Genesis to Revelation talking about tithes last week. You'd think if there was anything going to elude you, it'd be tithing. But there's plenty of Scripture. Now, there's there's quite a few Scriptures that talks about songs, and there's singing and sang or, and uh, sung. Uh, let's see, uh, melody, hymns, praise, worship, all of those kind of lend to this subject. Uh, but I was very specific in, in the study. And I, so I want to give you what I've, what I found. And uh, it may not be a whole lot to you, but it sure took a whole lot of long time to find it. And so, uh, first I want to offer you this, what the Old Testament teaches us about singing. I spent probably four hours Chasing down Old Testament singing. And the reason, and really not in its entirety of the Old Testament, I spent about four hours on this first thought that I'm about to give you. In Genesis chapter number 4, verse number 21, that's the first time music is mentioned. From there, you're going all the way to the end, near about the end of Genesis, before you hear too much about singing. 
And then from there you go to Exodus. And I'm thinking, you know, if, if God made man in His image, that would be singing all the time. And I never really paid any attention to it. I thought, well, surely Genesis is filled with singing, but it ain't. And so we look at Genesis chapter number 4, verse 21. If you want to turn over there with us, just keep your Bible open. Keep your songbook fanning in one hand, your Bible open in the other hand. And uh, we'll have you sling some fingers here and there and everywhere, all right? And so we look in Genesis chapter number 4. What has happened up to this point is um, Adam and Eve, they've been kicked out of the garden. Uh, and we find that Cain has committed that first murder. And now Cain, in verse number 16 of, of chapter number 4, Cain is now on his own and he is beginning to have children. And so we find that he had a son named Enoch. This is not the same Enoch that we hear about all the time. That's on another page. That's the next page. That Enoch was the son of Seth, just in case anybody was wondering. This Enoch was Cain's first child. Enoch had Arad in verse 18. Ahad had Mahuajel in verse 18. Mahuajel had Methuselah, and Methuselah had Lamech. Lamech, though, had Jabel and Jubal. Jubal is where we want to get to tonight in verse number 21. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and the organ. And so, by all accounts, up to this point, there's no mention in the book of Genesis, the first four chapters near about, of any type of music. Now, uh, there's a lot in Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3 that we don't know. Brother Terry, we don't know how old Adam and Eve were uh, we don't know how long they lived in the Garden of Eden before they sinned. We don't know any of those things. And so uh, we're taking on an assumption here. And uh, we're saying that up to this point there's been no music. I believe personally uh, that there was, but it's just not recorded. But the first recording of any type of music is here with this man named Jubal. And it says, He is the father of such that handle the harp and the organ. And so, by that, we understand that maybe in verse 21, there was no music, but very soon, as he began to grow, he began to develop these instruments uh, that he began to make music with. And I don't know that this is pertinent to the message tonight, uh, but if we go as far as generations, we see again, we don't know how old Adam was, but we know just by the generations that Jubal is the seventh generation uh, from Adam, and it's at the very least 175 years from the time that they sinned in the garden and the time that we find verse 21 of chapter 4. And one writer said that though music was not always associated as religious or used in worship, it, is fa it found its way quickly into the worship experience. He went on to say, Music is as much an integral part of the gathering of harvest as the worship in the sanctuary. The uniqueness is that while the harvest songs are sung, they are sung to the Lord of harvest, and that while battle songs are sung, Yahweh is to win the battle. And so, as they worked, they played music or they sang. As they went to battle, they played music and they sang. And so, Merrill Tinney is saying in this these two quotes, and he'll go on to say something else in just a moment, he is saying that even though we don't find music and we don't find singing in Genesis, we find that it is a part of life. Uh, if you, it doesn't matter who it is, I think, you know, probably Josie is probably the, the latest one that we've seen this. Uh, during the singing, during the music, she reacts to that. She didn't have to be taught. Our children are not taught to react to music. There's something in us that says, oh, there's, there's a beat, and so let's move. There's, there's, there's noise, and let's, uh, how many times have we given them a spoon in a pot, or, or a bowl, or something like that? What do they do? They don't have to be taught. They just begin to make music. And now it may seem like noise, and some have, have said this about Jubal, that at first it was just noise. 
There was no melody. There was no rhythm to it. He was just making noise on these uh, instruments. I don't know about that, but I do know that God eventually ordained those things so that it can be used in the church. So, uh, Merrill Tenney also said, Thus, if there is one consistent strand concerning music in the Old Testament, it is that it is inseparable from all of life. And this is that illustration that I just gave you. Uh, from the littlest person uh, unto the oldest, there's something about music. Uh, I could probably ask Miss uh, Tabitha tonight if music plays a role in her job in working with those elderly. And, and, and I'm not going to do that tonight. I don't want to put her on the spot. But for me, there are times that music can affect me to lift my spirits, but it can also affect me to put me in a almost a near state of depression. I love classical music. I wish I could play it. I wish I could do all that stuff and with the little fiddle and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you know what the difference between a violin and a fiddle is, Nathan? What is it? One has strings and one has strength. That's pretty good. But the real difference is Saturday night and Sunday morning. Okay, keep that in mind. So if you ever pick up the fiddle... Make sure you're playing a violin on Sunday morning, okay? And so, uh, I, I love classical music, but if I'm not careful, Brother Jody, some of that classical music will come in and, and there's those minor, minor chords or keys or whatever they may be, and those things will draw it down. And the, the, the rhythm, there, there is no rhythm to it as far as, you know, a, a real fast beat, but it's, it's, it's slow. And it's almost to the point where you are to relax and you're to enjoy it. But I can't do that. It puts me, puts me kind of down in a, in a little funk, if you will. But then they began to speed it up or I changed the channel and I listened to something more upbeat. And before I know it, then my spirits are high and I can enjoy myself. Music is an integral part of life. Now there, and I'm trying to hurry. There is a there, there's two verses that are pre-creation that we'll see. Now creation happened, Genesis one, Genesis two, okay. But before that, we find a writing in Ezekiel and in Job. In Ezekiel, we'll turn over there. Ezekiel chapter number twenty-eight. Uh, verse number 13 and 14. Now, if you have a Schofield, I am on page 871. Okay, Ezekiel chapter number 28, verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, he's speaking here, he's rebuking the king of Tyre, but in essence, he is showing us a picture of Satan here. And he says, you've been in the in Eden... The garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, diamond, barrel, onks, jasper, sapphire, emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. Now listen to what he says. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And so this is a is an image of Satan, a description of Satan before the creation of the world. And he says that you were skilled, you are a master of the tabrets and the pipes. Okay, so now let's look. That's talking about music. But then if we were to look back at the book of Job, chapter number 38, we find not only music, but we find songs. And we find singing before the creation of the world. Job chapter number 38, verse number 7. It says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So he's asking a question in verse number, in chapter number 38. He's asking Job. He says, I'm asking you some things, and I want you to answer me, Job. He says, Who is he that darketh the counsel of the, of, by words without knowledge? He says, Gird up your loins. And he said, Answer me. Verse 4. Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? 
He, he's asking him a series of questions. He gets down to verse number six. Uh, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. He is asking him these questions and he says, before the very foundations of the world were fitted together, he said, Job, were you there when the morning stars sang a song? And so we see that that even though it may be vague, I believe that even before creation, there was music and there was singing. We look, and I'm not going to read these just for sake of time, but I'll give them to you. Singing was associated with celebration. If you look in Genesis chapter number 31, verse number 27, who was at Laban talking to Jacob. He says, if you'd have let me know, I, I, would, have, I would have thrown a party and we would have sang songs. In Exodus chapter number 15, verse number 1, Moses and the people of Israel are free from Israel or from Egypt. And in verse number 1 of Exodus chapter 15, Moses sings a song. Now, if you go on through the verse number 20 and 21, it, it changes who's singing. Now, it's uh, Miriam, Moses' sister, and the women of the camp begin to sing a song, and they are doing this for a reason. They are celebrating their freedom. Then we see songs and singing seem to have been more prevalent in the kingdom age. Now, when I say kingdom age, I'm talking about starting at King Saul. He was the first king of Israel, first king, uh, and then we find from him to David, from David to Solomon, from Solomon down to his son. And so that begins the kingdom age. And in that, we can find in 1 Samuel 18, verse number 6, we can find singing or a song in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 16, 1 Chronicles chapter 25, verse number 6 and 7, and then in Isaiah chapter 26, verse number 1. All of these are during that kingdom age, and they begin to talk about singing or singing unto the Lord, or in some of these instances, singing a song to praise the king that's coming down the road. So, it gives us that idea that singing is associated with celebration. So now we, we look, and I'm trying to hurry so we can have time to pray at the end. Uh, we look at the examples of singing in the New Testament. Now, again, I want you to keep your Bibles with you. Matthew chapter number 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse number 30. We see in verse number 30... And when they had sung an hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now, <clears throat> this just goes to show you, just because you're singing doesn't mean things are all hunky-dory. Can somebody help me right there? Some of the best times I've had singing is when everything was wrong in my life. I'll be, on, I'll be dead honest with you. I mean, man, I got, I've had a burden. I told my wife and kids Sunday morning when I left this place Sunday morning, there was such a burden that got upon me that I didn't know what to do with. Still not entirely sure what to do with it. But I'm going to tell you something, Brother Jody. I've been down in my office and I've tuned up my guitar and I've begun to sing Amazing Grace and I'd sing this song and I'd begin to sing that song. And man, today I got over there, there's room at the cross. For you, I like to tore the whole place undone down there. Just because there's something about that song uh, that does something for us. That there, there's something about the singing of God's hymns that will do something for us. And so we look here in Matthew 26, and they said that they had sung a hymn. Then they went out into the Mount of Olives. Well, if you look there in verse number 20, uh, excuse me, verse number 32, verse 33 and 34, Jesus is telling them, Peter, you're fixing to deny me. Peter says there in verse number 33, he said, I ain't, I, I'm, I'm going to go with you till death. Verse 35, he says, I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. And so Jesus and all of the disciples, the, the, that very early church, if you will, they are singing a hymn. They are giving glory to God, but doom is just right around the corner. Okay, y'all, y'all still stay with me. So 
that was the first mention of singing, of songs, of melody, and all of these. There's about 15 different words that all tie back to singing or songs in our Bible. And so uh, the very first mention is Matthew 26:30. Then we look over, and there's a few more in the new te- in the in the gospels, and they generally speaking they they come right back to this instance here. But then we look over in the book of Acts, Acts chapter number uh, sixteen. Now I thought for sure at Pentecost I might be able to find some singing. I thought maybe one of those folks that were sure enough filled with the Holy Ghost would break out, would break out with amazing grace. How sweet the sound. I thought for sure somebody was going to break out and start singing blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I thought for sure somebody at Pentecost after Jesus just died was laid in a grave and woke up the next morning was saying he's alive. But no, they didn't. Nobody said a song until Acts chapter number 16. And in Acts chapter number 16, again, this is a dire situation. Paul and Silas, they are in prison now. They're in prison. Look with me at verse number something, another. How much was it? All right, 25. They were in prison and at Paul, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. What's this say? What's those next two verses? Anybody say it to me? Unto God. And the prisoners heard them. (laughs) I'm going to tell you something. If the foundations of the prison never shook, if their bonds never fell off, it was that the prisoners heard them, I believe, was the whole crux of this situation. They, from, From what I understand, they were in the inner Jail. They weren't just in the jail. They, the jail had its own jail and they were, they were in the inner jail. The, the, uh, I can't even remember now what the name of it is, uh, but they were there and there was no escape. There was no light. There was no circulation. There was no hope whatsoever. But all of a sudden at midnight, and I believe Miss Leah, they probably didn't know what time it was. They just knew that they needed to get a hold of God. And they prayed. What do we do first in our churches? We pray. And then they sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. So while they were in bonds, they sang praises. And it's funny because this word praises, it comes from the word that we get the word him from. H-Y-M-M. In. It is the Greek word whom neo, and it means to sing the praise of God. So quite literally, it says that they sang praises unto God. They defined their own meaning here. And you and I can glean from this because it means to sing praises to God. Uh, Noah Webster said, it is a hymn is an ode to honor God, a short poem conv- composed for religious service, a song of joy and praise to God. I'm just, I'm not going to sing it, I don't think, but I want you to hear the words to this song. It's page number 97. If you ain't careful, singing about this song, Jesus Saves, will sure enough get your giddy up all in a bind. I'm going to tell you. It says, we have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the gladness all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news. Bear the news, tell the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the caves. Onward, tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. That second verse said, Wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus saves. Tell to sinners far and wide, Jesus saves. Sing ye islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean caves. Earth shall sing her jubilee, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife, Jesus saves. By His death and endless life, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom, when the heart for mercy craves. Sing in triumph o'er the tomb, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. He said, give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus saves. 
Let the nations now rejoice, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free, highest hill and deepest cave. This, our song of victory, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. There is something about these hymns, as Noah Webster said, they are poems, but they are not just poems, but they are to be, they are composed for religious service, and they act as a song of joy and praise to God. What happened there, I didn't pay attention to who wrote that, but what happened is they got a hold of the fact that Jesus saved them, and they couldn't contain it anymore, and they began to pin down, hey, on the hills, and in the valley, in the oceans and in the caves, in battle, in triumph. Let's sing because it is our victory that Jesus saves. When you look up this, this word hymn or they sang praises, it also says that this was likely the Paschal Psalms. And I thought, man, I know what Paschal is. It's talking about the Lamb. You hear the phrase Paschal Lamb. It's usually used around Passover or around Easter. And as I said, I know what Paschal is, but what are we talking about Paschal Psalms? Well, it, it led me over to Psalm 113 to 118 and then to chapter 136. And so I began to read those and began to see. And you know who it talked about? The Lamb. And he said it's very likely that as Paul and Silas were in the prison, the words maybe, though they may not have known him uh, personally, the words of John the Baptist, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, may have echoed in their minds and in their hearts. And they began to sing about that Lamb that came and took away their sin. They be- I be- Mm. They began to sing about the Lord God Almighty how that sent His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting. They began to sing about the One that was the Deliverer in the Old Testament uh, for Moses and the people of Israel. But they began to sing about the Deliverer uh, that delivered Paul on the road to Damascus that delivered Silas somewhere along the way. They began to sing about the Lamb of God and Folks, if there's any subject that we ought to find joy and peace in, it's about singing praise to the Lamb of God. That's why we sing in our New Testament churches. Paul went on and he said that we need to sing in the Spirit in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 14 and 15. He says, I want you to sing in the Spirit, and I want you to sing with understanding. He says, I want you to know what you're singing. Now, if they were singing psalms, guess what they had to do? They had to memorize the psalms so that they could... If you look in your your Bible, you'll see songs of ascent. Those were songs written for the children of Israel or the people of Israel uh, to sing as they were going to the tabernacle or to the temple. And so they were ascending up to the place of God's house, that tabernacle or, or synagogue, whatever you may want to call it. And so as we today begin to sing the hymns of God, we ought to know what it says. We ought to have hidden the Word of God in our heart, but know what these hymns say. And furthermore, sing them with spirit. There's nothing more discouraging to this pastor than to come in here and someone say, uh, whether it's me or Nathan or Brother David, and saying, all right, let's turn to page number 12 and let's sing a little bit. And then we get out there and we... Well, you just need to sit down. Now, I'm just going to tell you, because that's not singing to God. That's singing because you have to. That's singing because you're tired and you're weary. Well, fooey on all that mess. You're in the house of God and He's worthy. He's more worthy than your boss man that you put in 40 or 60 hours. He's more worthy than Uncle Sam that you pay taxes to. He's more worthy than that man that signs your check. This is God Almighty. And when we're in His house, we ought to sing in the Spirit with understanding. You're welcome. In Ephesians chapter number 5, Paul gives us... I'm going to take four more minutes. Y'all clock me. 
Don't tell me if I went over, but just I just kind of want to see. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5, Paul gives a long list of direct warnings. I'm not going to go through all of them, but starting there in verse number 18, he says, Be not drunk with wine where is in excess. I'm not going to deal with that right now. He says, be filled with the Spirit. That means literally to be crammed full with the Spirit. You can't hold no more of Him. He said we ought to be filled with the Spirit. But then He says, speaking to yourselves in psalms. Now, a psalm, I've mentioned those quite a, quite a bit. A psalm is a melodious psalm. It's not a chant. A lot of times when I hear people sing the psalms, it's it's just just kind of uh, mundane. It, it just but now there there is a few people that they they can sing it and they they can sing it right. They can sing it with with I feel like the right intonations of the song and and the right breath here and the right right pause here and and I believe that the psalms uh, uh, I believe that they are to be sang with feeling. It's a melodious song. It has a melody to follow. But it's also a pious song. Most of the time, when we hear the word pious, we think in the negative connotation. It's someone that maybe thinks that they're better than you. But the word pious means devout. And uh, so this, a psalm is, so, is, 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 is something that's sang from someone that has a good relationship with God. Someone that's close to God. He says, speaking to yourselves... Now, if you've ever wanted permission to talk to yourself, right here is, you've got Bible for it. Speak into yourselves in psalms and hymns. This again is that word, uh, hymneo or humneo, and it is to sing praise of God. But he goes on, he says spiritual songs. Now, I had to deal, deal, dig into this a little bit. This is a song from a man's spirit Unto God. Let's look at it again. It says there in verse number 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. If you notice, this is a, a, a little s, a lowercase s. This is not talking about necessarily songs that God's Spirit is all over, though that's great. But he says that these are songs that are from your spirit to God. If we're saved, that Holy Spirit lives within us. And He says that we need to utilize that in this instance in verse number 19. And we ought to speak to ourselves in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs. In other words, let what is in your heart come out unto God. Allow Him to hear it. He says, singing and making melody in your heart. To the Lord. This singing is the idea of praise. The lyrical emotion of a devout and grateful soul. He says making melody. This is... Four minutes are up. To pluck, to cause to vibrate, to strike a chord, or to sing the music of a harp. He says speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns. Spiritual songs, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Colossians 3.16 tells us that we ought to teach and we ought to admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And here it, it, it says that we ought to sing with grace. And I believe this, this singing with grace is the idea that we ought to sing with an understanding of what God, a knowledge of received grace. Has God been graceful to you? Then when we sing, that's that spirit that we need to sing with. James chapter 5 verse number 13 says that when you're sick, pray. But he says when you're merry, sing psalms. Sing unto the Lord. In Revelation chapter number 5, verse number 9, it says that we will sing a new song. So after the rapture is gone, the church is called up to be with the Lord forever in the air. 
we're going to have a brand new song. I don't know what it's going to be. There's a whole lot of good songs out here, Brother Bobby. But it's going to be a good song. Uh, uh, Braylon likes the song that C.T. Towns and them sing, Angels Sit Down. And it didn't make no sense for the first two years I listened to it. Until Lori finally, I think it was Lori, she finally said, you need to listen to this song. I'm like, I don't like it. She said, you just need to shut up and listen to it. So I said, yes, ma'am. And I did what she told me to do. And I, I didn't get the premise of the song. Just, just angels sit down. I don't want to hear about angels. I want to hear about the blood. I want to hear, man, I got to listen to that doggone thing. And it's talking about that new song. And it's talking about one of these days of the angels that's flying around saying, holy, 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 they're going to have to sit down and we're going to stand up and we're going to sing a new song. So why do we have singing? In, why do we sing in church? Well, we've got some examples from the Old Testament. We've got some examples from the New Testament. It teaches us that we ought to praise God. Ephesians 5.19 says that we ought to encourage ourselves, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns. Colossians 3.16, we're to admonish others. Singing encourages others. Now, And I'm not being funny or mean, but there's some folks that they just don't have the talent. They don't have the skill, the voice, whatever, to be able to sing. But I have found that those people that can't sing are the ones that love singing the most. And they love it when people will get up and sing a song and they don't care how it sounds. They just like singing because it encourages them. We, we ought to endeavor in this church and everywhere that we go to sing songs about God. We can sing songs about Mama. We can sing songs about Daddy. Lori and I sing a song it's called What a God. And man, it's a wonderful song. But we don't sing it too often because it talks about an old man in the first verse. And uh, sometimes it gets emotional because there's some old men of God that's, that's not with us anymore. And that's kind of what that, ver- that song talks about. But uh, there's still that almost like a, a country music feel about mama teaching angels how to sing and all this other kind of stuff. So we don't hardly sing it. And I'll go one step further, and we're talking about singing in church. I believe that, I believe, I believe that if we're to sing one way in church, we ought to be listening to the right stuff outside of church, and we ought to be singing the right stuff outside of church. We've had some conversations, and I found out that in camp meeting, during camp meeting, there was some folks riding around and they had the radio blaring. And the way it was phrased to me is listening to rock and roll music. And I realize the definition of music is probably different from different folks. But I tell you what, when you kids get together, when us adults get together, when we're by ourselves, we still need to be listening to stuff that's going to glorify God. Amen. Don't listen. If it, and I know this is an oxymoron, but if it had been in the Waylon Jennings days and the, and the uh, George Jones days and stuff like that, I might would have got on board with you. But all they did, they they sung just as bad as stuff now. But now you don't even know you're listening to country music. It sounds like they're rapping all the time and they got the wicky 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 and all that kind of bull in it. And I don't know, that's just that ain't country. I can't even can't even pump my gas without. Now, I'm just going to say it, some thug coming up and having a bunch of boogity boogity stuff going on. And you, you, you can't, you want to close the door, roll the windows up so your family don't hear this mess. Well, the problem is, problem is, they liable to be at church the next Sunday singing about Amazing Grace. All the while listening to all this shaking music and everything else. Now, I'm not trying to be funny and I'm not trying to be crude, but I'm just saying... Man alive, if we're going to sing to God here, we better use that voice and that talent to sing the right stuff out there. Paul and Silas, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. You better mark it down. People are hearing what you're playing on your radio. Now, I play my radio too loud anyway. It don't matter if it's Karen Peck and New River, Gaither Vocal Band, or the Chuck Wagon Gang. It's going to be loud. 
One, I'm deaf. Two, I like loud music, but at least it's right music. But if I get behind, if I get around somebody that don't know what I'm listening to, they're liable to put their hands on their hip and shake their head at me and say, what are you listening to, preacher? But I promise it's good music. And what I mean by good, it's not my opinion that it's good. It's godly music. 